and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, I check out Cheetahsoft. I review some games. I have a chat to Jeff. And end with a look at some books. Let's get on with it then. marketing have been on the Spectrum scene from the start. Starting life in December 1982 with just five people including Melvin Beresford, the managing director, and his wife and three others. Their first products were ramp packs for the ZX81, Jupiter Ace, and a few months later the Spectrum. They went on to develop and sell a multitude of peripherals for the Spectrum, many being instantly recognisable like the Spectrum, the Cheetah Rat and of course the MIDI interface, not to mention their well-known joysticks like the Cheetah 125 and Star Pro. There were other oddities too, like the Cheetah Bug and a series of joysticks that looked like famous characters, and of course the Cheetah Defender light gun. Before this though, they thought they would try their hand at software, and in 1984 Cheetah set up a subsidiary and with Peter Hardingham as marketing director, Cheetahsoft was born. The first game on this new label was 3D Bat Attack, released in July 1984. Now this game may look familiar to readers of your computer magazine. It is the same as the type-in called Drachman that not only appeared inside, but also got the front cover treatment. The authors are the same, so this is undoubtedly the same game with slight modifications. And the story goes, well, it doesn't. You are just in a maze collecting gold and you have to fight your way along. You are of course hunted by vampire bats, um, maybe that's a link to Drachman then. To kill the bats you have to eat some garlic, and these are in the four corners of the maze. And to see a maze you press the zero key and it appears on screen, and yes it does look like a Pac-Man maze. The view shows a wireframe 3D maze that judders along, and on the floor are blocks of gold, and if you move over them, you pick them up. It's a bit like Pac-Man then. When viewing the maze, you can see any remaining garlic, and of course the chasing ghosts, uh, I mean bats. Movement is slow and key response is terrible. Often you get stuck in a dead end or corner, and if you press the key that's supposed to rotate you, nothing happens. Instead, you either bump into a wall or move in a different direction, but not the one you're facing. This often means you lose a life. I'm not really sure why the rotate key doesn't actually work, or in fact, it only works some of the time. It is slightly better with a joystick, but only just. It was at this point that I found out if you're using a joystick and you press the bottom row of keys whilst holding the left or right, you do actually rotate and this made the game playable, but not any better I'm afraid. Sound is bad with just a few blips here and there, and for the first few times of playing I never actually found a bat. When I did though it was quite well drawn to be honest. The whole control method seems broken, the rotate keys don't often do it, and the move direction just judders about. However, sometimes they do work, and it's even more confusing when that happens. Overall then, a very annoying and confusing game. The similarities with this and Drachman were noticed by gamers and letters were sent to magazines. In reply, Cheetahsoft claimed that the typing was not complete and didn't work, and that the author didn't include everything in it. They claimed that they asked the author to allow them to market the game and the result was 3D Bat Attack. The game is also very similar to a recently recovered game called Planet 10 from Mastertronic. The screen layout is pretty much the same and the map view is there as well. It's just that it's by a different author and looks slightly better. The next game coming out was Conquest, a strategy game. Side one of the tape had lots of instructions, and you don't really need to read them all if you want to get an understanding of the game. I'm not a big fan of strategy games, so much of it was lost on me. You set up a capital first, and this can be anywhere on the map. You then move your men around, conquering adjacent territories. 
and as they are conquered, they turn red. When you conquer six squares, you get an extra garrison, and these can be moved around as well, doing more conquering and more turning red of blocks. So you soon build up a small group of soldiers, stamping about, turning the whole land red. As you keep building your territory, the land may get attacked by barbarians, and all that happens is the land is turned back to green, so you keep having to go around turning it back to red again. To win the game you have to conquer 100 squares. So you plod about the map, and as you conquer each one, the game takes longer and longer because it has to work out what each of your garrisons are doing and whether the barbarians are going to randomly attack you or not. If you like strategy games, I'm not sure this is the best one to try to be honest, there isn't any management of food or money or health or anything like that, just endless moving about filling in squares. Moving on then. And next to hit the shelves was their last homegrown game, The Perils of Bear George. You have to guide George back to his cave so he can hibernate. The first screen involves eating lots of apples, so he can make it through the winter. George moves slowly about on screen, and here you guide him underneath the falling apples. Sometimes they bounce off his head though, because you have to be pointing upwards at this point with his mouth open. Randomly a squirrel will appear in the trees above and drop acorns on him, and this will knock him out for a while. The level goes on and on, with your food meter going up or down, depending on whether you're eating apples or letting them bounce off your head. And did I mention the terrible music that's playing all the way through? The teddy bear's picnic? Mmm, well it doesn't get any better I'm afraid. The graphics are quite smooth though, and well drawn, and you can make George move a little quicker by holding the space key down but it only is a little bit quicker. Eventually though you'll get onto the next stage, and now you're onto the ski slopes, and here you have to get George to his cave, and hope you have eaten enough. Skiers come flying down the slopes at a great speed that makes them pretty much impossible to dodge. If you can get George to the bottom of the screen, then you just need to keep nudging up and right until eventually you reach the cave. Once you get into the cave, the tune changes again to Hall of the Mountain King. Yes, the same one used in Manic Minor. And here you just have to walk past the spiders. This is a fairly easy bit, you just wait for them to get high enough and then run past them. If you get past this, you just have to walk to the end and have a little sleep, or starve to death if you haven't eaten enough apples. And that's the game. If he does survive, it starts all over again. In September 1984, Cheetahsoft forged a relationship with an American software producer called Imagic to bring their games to the spectrum and the first of these were Moonsweeper and Dragonfire. They seemed to indicate that these would be the first of many, but as time will show, this was not the case. Moonsweeper then, this had a really nice inlay that reminded me very much of the Vectrex games. The inlay gives you the story, and you're a pilot, flying the Moonsweeper radar on a mission to rescue stranded lunar pioneers. The first thing you have to do is search for the moon, and this takes the form of a space game where you fly about and shoot meteors and try and land on one of the planets. The planets are those round spheres, by the way. As you fly about turning left and right, you fire left and right, and eventually you'll get onto one of the planets and can get down onto the next level. Here you go onto the planet's surface, and this reminds me very much of the arcade game Juno First, or even Beam Rider, and it looks really nice, the 3D effect is great. 
Here you shoot and avoid the enemy and try to collect six stranded pioneers. Be careful though because you can shoot them as well. Sound throughout the game is used very well, and I must admit I really started to enjoy this game. I've never seen this one before, and I'm quite impressed by it really. Once you've collected all six men, you have to take off from the planet again, and you do this by flying through a series of gates. And it's then back into space looking for the next planet. All in all, I like it. It's not what I expected, but yes, it's very addictive. Definitely the best Cheetah Soft game so far. On to the next one then, and Dragonfire. The kingdom has been threatened by a group of rebels who have taken over the castle, and a young Prince William has vowed to fight back. Let's have a go then. Whoa, what the? This is like a turbo hunchback. This is impossible. You can duck and jump to avoid the fireballs, but most of the time it's... The controls are over-responsive and things move far too quickly. Now if I can just get into the castle... Aha, there you go. Now we're onto this second part. And here you have to run around collecting the treasure and avoiding the fireballs from the dragon. Okay, simple enough. Nothing too difficult there then. So it's back out and... Oh dear, back to this section again with the fireballs moving even quicker. Well that's it, I'm not sure what to say. The sound is nice I suppose. Back to Cheetahsoft then, and in April 1985, Cheetahsoft dropped their prices of all their titles to just £3.50, and we're now concentrating more on peripherals. It seemed they were better at that than games, and went on to produce some excellent add-ons. I thought that they had reused Cheetahsoft label for the Spectrum expansion kits, but upon photographing them, I noticed the logo and name was still Cheetah Marketing. They did produce some brilliant peripherals though, and this is what they'll be remembered for I'm sure. They continued to make joysticks too, with a wide range of interesting ideas for a wide range of computers and consoles. I think it's best we forget the games though, well, apart from Moonsweeper, which is brilliant. Smash TV was a violent, bloodthirsty game released into the arcades in 1990 by Williams. Using a dual controller, you played a contestant in a futuristic game show, weirdly set in 1999. The aim is just to survive long enough to get a chance to fight the show's host to win your freedom. Sounds a lot like the film The Running Man, and it does have many similarities. Bingo! Shotguns, bombs, whirling blades and other weapons are all used to destroy, decapitate, maul and mutilate and generally do unpleasant things to the hordes of enemies in each room. If you survive long enough, you move to the next room and things get harder. As you go, you can also collect prizes. The graphics were great, with blood and limbs flying all over the place. The sound was brilliant too, with great speech and effects. So how would all this transfer to the spectrum then? Released in 1991 by Ocean, the game was praised by the magazines at the time, although the Spectrum version was single player only, and did not have the option to use two joysticks, unlike some other home versions. The game begins with some nice music, and once into the game, the action is fast and furious. The first room has different enemies than the arcade, and can be tricky to get past. Sprites are large and although this makes the game look okay, it does limit the space you have, which can be real disadvantage when things hot up.
there are two types of sprite. Single colour ones that move smoothly, and coloured ones that move in character blocks. And this includes the player sprite. It does make the game seem very colourful, and there is hardly any colour clash to be seen, but it does make for a jerky game in some instances. It can also lead to a screen full of colour, with blood, pickups, several types of enemy, weapon fire and spinning shields all flying about at the same time, often making it difficult to see what's happening. There are various pickups that mimic the arcade, and these all help to destroy the enemy in glorious blobs of red blood. You can get three-way shots, smart bombs, money, spinning shields and more. If you do manage to finish the first room, the next room is even more challenging. As the arcade game announces, total carnage, which brings me to the negatives. The big letdown for me is the sound. It's almost non-existent. It's very disappointing to play this game in almost silence. There are blips when firing and blips when something gets blown up, but that's about it. I wasn't expecting arcade perfect sound, but I was hoping for a little more, considering the year of the release. The gameplay is fun and certainly challenging, and this will keep you busy for a while if you enjoy this type of game. I enjoyed it, not as much as the arcade version, but it was good to play and compare. If it had better sound, it would have made for a much better gaming experience. It is though a solid shooter, with plenty of variety and good action all the way. This is Sidewise, released by Firebird Software in 1987. The four worlds of Omnicron are under siege, and it's your job to sort it all out. Yes, it's a horizontal shooter, released late in the Spectrum's life. Instead of the usual spaceship, however, you are depicted as a man. Yes, you are flying about just like Jetpack, but a little bit larger. As you proceed, various waves of aliens appear, and you shoot them, and wait for the next wave. I think you know this style of game by now. The whole game is monochrome, either green, cyan, yellow or magenta, depending on which level or planet you start with, and you are given a choice at the start. As you blast, you get power-ups, and these include extra lives, speed-ups, laser, force fields, you know, the usual stuff. The graphics are large and well-drawn and smooth, but the game is hard. In fact, very hard, and in places unfair. If you go to the forest world, you'll get a speed up. That is if you are good enough, but losing this will mean the end of a game a few waves later, when massive walls come flying across the screen, with holes at the top and bottom, and you need this extra speed power up to stand a chance of actually getting past these. And that meant for me the majority of time it was game over. The other planets are equally as tricky, with some mean aliens to fight off. Some requiring multiple shots to destroy them, others seemingly impossible to kill. The array and patterns of aliens is impressive, but the game starts to become frustrating, no matter how much of the levels you memorise. Sound is used well, but the effects remind me of early Quicksilver games. I tried for nearly 30 minutes, probably longer, to make progress on the levels and didn't really manage it at all. To see more of the planets I had to use the cheats, and that meant I got to see some of the scenery. Up until now it had just been open space. There are two levels of parallax scrolling too, which is really nice, and the enemies keep on coming. However, when the game has background scenery, the audio stopped. Not really sure why that was, unless they are putting all of the processing power into driving the graphics. You work your way through the various waves and get to a boss battle at the end of every planet. The game would be great if it wasn't so frustrating. It feels like the authors didn't want you to get far and didn't want you to enjoy it. 
which is a pity really as the game could have been brilliant. One for the experts only then. I always enjoy a new shoot 'em up for the Spectrum, and here is Laserbirds, released in 2020 by Technamic Software. The game is a fast and frantic shooter that keeps you on your toes as wave after wave of Laserbirds swoop about intent on your destruction. The graphics are multicoloured, so this game won't work on every model, and the author says it's targeted for the 48K machines only although it does work on the next using the VGA port running at 50Hz. The graphics are chunky and remind me a little bit of the Atari 2600. They're certainly different and work well on this style of game. They are smooth and colourful and the aliens change colour on later levels, by which time they start to move really quickly and vary their attack patterns. Sound is a little underused but fits the game well and you don't notice it as much when blasting those birds out of the colourful sky. There are different waves on later levels and your ship takes to the skies, although I couldn't get that far. I did get to a large boss battle and beyond that, and I was really enjoying this game. It's quite addictive, and because it looks different from other Spectrum games, it somehow feels different too, in a good way. A good shooter then, and one to have a go at if you like this style of game. And now another new game, and yes another shooter. This is Redshift released as part of the ZX Dev MIA competition in 2019. We start with the story and some nice music, and the presentation is really good. This is the Spectrum version of an unreleased game called Galaxian 3, and I have to tell you, it's a cracking game. <laughs> Great music as the landscape scrolls smoothly beneath your ship, and some nice effects included here too. The graphics, although monochrome, work well and things are easy to spot, which is a common failing for other monochrome games. As you go you collect bonuses and pickups that increase your weaponry and build up your ship. These are added automatically, and also removed automatically if you take damage. Control is good, and the game feels really nice to play. This is a game you must get if you love shoot 'em ups. Highly recommended. So we're looking at questions that appeared on Twitter when I asked for questions for Let's Talk About. There were quite a few interesting ones, some we'd already done and some we hadn't. So um, let's kick off with, if the ZX, this is by Preston Thomas, if the ZX Spectrum was never about, what other machine would you would have caught your eye? It would have to be the C64, wouldn't it? Sadly, I'd have to agree. <laughs> Although... I really wanted to get into things like the MSX and have mm. a look at what they could do. You know, there was loads of loads of sort of I wouldn't say odd machines, but there were lots of machines that were nowhere as popular as the the hardcore ones. Things like the Aquarius and things like that. I really wanted to have a look and see what they could do, but yeah. never did. But from the machines that I experienced, the sixty four would probably be the one thing. The colour palette was a bit murky brown, but the sound was awesome. Mm. And Maybe maybe one of the others that were around at the time would have filled the gap. The Auric or the Dragon. Yeah, the Dragon was... was I think the Dragon was similar, lim, similarly limited to the, as the Spectrum was. It had limited yeah. resolution and sound and colour. 
So did the equipment. I mean, all of the machines were really limited one way or another. I mean, the, the 64 itself was limited by the, the palette and the, the large um, pixels that you got on sprites and that sort of thing. I think the answer to that one has to be the C64, though, doesn't it? Yeah. What about the Amstrads, though? I never, I never had one of the Amstrads, you know, the 464s or anything like that. No, I didn't either. They were a bit expensive. and They, had, they needed their own monitor. Yeah. They, they came with a monitor that you had to buy. The budget model of that was a green screen monitor that was just horrible. I wouldn't have wanted that. <laughs> Unless you were playing text adventures. This is a Twitter question that no one asked, so I thought I'd ask it myself. And I'd be interested to know your thoughts, Jeff, on this. What era of the spectrum do you think produced the best games? Was was it the early 80s, the mid 80s, the late 80s or the 90s? I'm probably going to say the mid 80s. Right. Certainly 84, 85, 86. When Ultimate were doing their really, really good stuff. Your Night Laws and your Alienates. I mean, the, the early days, some of the early stuff was quite literally basic mm. uh, and terrible. And then when Jetpack came along, uh, things changed. And then when Night Law came along, things changed. And people dis- uh, suddenly realised that the machine was capable of much more than eight character pixel graphics sort of juddering across the screen. Yeah. But there were some really good stuff later on, Midnight Resistance and uh, Robocop and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, Robocop was really, really good. I mean, some some of the early games were amazing, though. Chucky Egg and Jetpack's probably one. Jetpack and Attic Attack probably fit in the early ones as well. Yeah, I think, um, I think they, were, they were sort of breaking new ground. They were looking at things that had never been done on that machine or, or, or on home micros, and they were just throwing anything and everything they could at it. You know, there was games with weird things in there. You just got to look at, take a look at Manic Miner or Cosmic Kanga or some weird stuff like that. Yeah, um, yeah, Manic Manic Miner and Jet Set Willy, and there was some there was some real gems in the in the early years, and then it got really refined. And then it got really really commercial, and everything was monochrome and yeah. window boxed, and it was it was kind of like they had an engine and just put a different character in it every single time. <laughs> Yeah, and then there was there was some people that that overextended themselves and tried to do things like Pit Fighter on the Spectrum, which was never going to work and and didn't. Well, even that, even some original games were were very very ambitious. Swords and Sorcery was one I remember. I loved playing that, but mm. you you got to think, oh, that, this is they they've really tried to stretch this a bit too far. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I think the the majority of games that are associated with the Spectrum were released probably. 84, 85, 86, some, you know, all the uh, yeah. the Manic Miners. I know Hobbit was 82, but Manic Miner, Night Law, uh, all that sort of stuff. I think the ones that are uniquely associated with the Spectrum were, were in that period. Mm. Not taking away anything from the stuff that came out later, because there was some really good stuff. People figured out how to do proper scrolling and how to do smooth sprites and larger sprites and all that kind of stuff. There, there were too many 3D isometric games. Oh, yeah, there were, the, the market was flooded with those. It was. Um, Some of them were terrible, but then you get then you got the the gems like head over heels. Yeah. So I think that ends the the questions from Twitter. Thank you for all those people that that posted on Twitter. If you've got any more suggestions, keep them coming. Ooh. It's time to look at some books again. The first is The Spectrum Programmer from 1983, an early book designed to explore Sinclair Basic and help budding programmers learn how to do different things. It seems my copy came from Nottinghamshire County Council. I do like the introductory chapter though, what is a computer? Hmm, interesting to buy this book if you don't actually know the answer to that. It does though go through the CPU, memory and other aspects of the Spectrum as a sort of basic, no pun intended, guide to how the computer works. There's also a brief history of the Sinclair Spectrum before we get into the book for real. Every element of BASIC is covered, from how to use the keyboard to get the different functions, through the print command, variables, input, loops, go subs and go tos, strings, you name it, it's all in here. It's very informative and well written, with lots of good examples for you to try out. Much of the content though is covered in the Spectrum manual, but this would be a good starting book if you wanted to know a little bit more. The next book is Over the Spectrum from Melbourne House, also published in 1983. This book takes a different approach to teaching the basic programming language. It offers 30 typing listings, covering all interests, 
and each one is fully explained before showing the listing. That means that hopefully you should understand what's going on as you're typing. The games are, obviously, quite simple, but some are interesting to me. Take this one, Spectrum Invaders. Once you've typed it out and run it, you will see a familiar character. Yes, Horace is here in multiple forms, pretending to be space invaders. The game itself is quite good actually, fun to play with some nice large graphics. Also of interest is this one, Freeway Frog. Now running this, and you may get the feeling that you've seen this somewhere before, possibly on the first screen of Horace Ghost Skiing. Yes, it's slow, and yes, it's jittery, but you get the idea. Still keeping with the arcade theme, and here's Alien Blitz. Quite a nice little game, this, with colourful graphics. Simple gameplay, but enjoyable nonetheless. There are more than just games in this book, too. There are educational titles, gambling, utilities, and business programmes. It's a real mixed bag, and you have certainly got value for your money, especially if you bought it on eBay 30 years after it came out. The only problem I could find with the book is it doesn't tell you which keys to use to control the games, and the games don't tell you themselves, you have to go digging through the code. Anyway, more books in a future episode.